Well, I'm just going to introduce um, ourselves and then hand off to the exciting group that we have tonight. And um, mostly thank you all for coming. It's really exciting to be part of uh, Design Week Portland. Um, we are Creative Capital Design. My name is Rebecca, and my business partner is Britta. And we have uh, part of our staff here, Brianna in the back, and Mina, and a number of other folks here who, there she is who support us. We uh, started about five years ago, and we are a design uh, firm, a design collective, a design group, and uh, uh, that works on apparel design specifically here in the industry, um, with a focus on uh, active and outdoor product, so alpine innovation, um, kind of technical product, and um, and we're really fortunate enough to be a part of the Portland design um, scene and industry here, and with all of you creatives as well. Um, it's really become such a hub for that. So we work with uh, a number of different brands, but we also work with startups, and um, uh, with that, uh, we are also just thrilled to be hosting a couple other events this week. So tomorrow uh, is a, another panel of experts and, and inspiring folks at uh, Nemo Design called uh, Disruptive Design. And then on Thursday, we are doing a collaboration with uh, Bora Architects and um, just uh, ex ex uh, sort of... Um, uh, yeah, it's an experience, but it's it's a challenge of what is comfort in architecture, and softness in material. And we are uh, they are working with a structure that is uh, material based, and we are taking that material into product. And that will be in the parking lot of uh, the Pika uh, area and space. So you can look forward to that. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Britta Cabanos, my business partner and inspiring friend. Hi. I wish I had my phone right now because I want to take a picture of these three ladies, four ladies, three ladies over here knitting. I think that's so awesome. They bring their knitting with them. I love that. Um, so yeah, like Rebecca said, we're Creative Capital Design and about a year ago, actually a year ago on April 10th, we launched a online community um, social network called Inside Fashion Design. So if you guys purchase tickets, you might have seen Creative Capital and Inside Fashion Design. So I just wanted to explain that a little bit. We get a lot of questions about that. Um, I'll give you a little bit of history and I, ha I have my notes because there's, I really want to tell this story. And um, just in general, I love stories. I love listening to stories. I love hearing stories. Stories are a way that we pass on information. It's a way to teach a lesson. It's a way to invoke a sense of compassion and you can get sucked into a good story so deeply that you can completely lose yourself and you can lose track of time, like when you're knitting. Um, and when I hear a good story, I wanna share it. I, I just wanna pass it on. If there's something that touched me, I just wanna pass it on to other people. Um, so Inside Fashion Design was created just for that. After being in the industry for 20 some years, um, I worked on the East Coast for a while, for 15 years, and then moved out here. And I've met so many great people along the way, and I just had this thought that, you know, these people need to share their stories, and how can we do that? So we created Inside Fashion Designs just for that. And it kind of started out as a blog, um, but then it's now growing into so much more. Um, so when you have a moment, visit the site. We love to share stories. We'd love to hear your story. On your chair, um, there are two index cards. So if you're interested in just talking about a project you're working on or a problem you're having, or if you're a designer that's striving to start your own line, um, it could be anything. You know, leave us a note. You can fill out your card, um, put your email or something on the postcard and you can hand it to one of us after and we'd love to just hear your story. We have Erin actually as our writer um, and she's done a fabulous job of creating a voice for us at Inside Fashion Design. So I have one story now and I'll then I'll pass it over to Lauren. Um, we're apparel designers like Rebecca said and I had this goal I guess or this idea of trying to create an apparel line made from everything in the U.S. So I started doing all my research, 
fabric. The first place I start is fabric. So I'm digging around, I'm looking for fabric suppliers. I cannot find, I was looking for linens and silk and hemp, you know, beautiful fabrics that I could use. There's nothing here. So I found a company, say in Colorado, and they had hemp, they were importing it from China. So I kept digging around, doing some research, and I stumbled upon Pacific Northwest Fiber Shed. And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna send an email. So I sent an email, and it landed in this lovely lady's mailbox, Shannon, and here she was in Portland. So we connected, I think the first time we had coffee, we could have talked for hours. She told me about what she was doing, um, and that so inspired me, and I want her to grow this flax as fast as she can because I want that fabric to make a line out of. So that kind of spurred the idea for this panel. Um, I think it's a topic that we all care about, and if you're here, I'm sure you care about it. And all of these folks that I've been introduced to through Shannon are so impressive and so inspiring, and I can't wait for you guys to hear from them because they they're, have motivated me, and their stories are amazing. So with that, I will introduce Lauren, our moderator. And also, while you're up here, I just want to say thank you guys. You guys have been amazing to learn from, and you have inspired me, and Lauren, you as well. So. Lauren, all yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Can I get in there? So I'm going to join you all here. My name's Lauren Holden Kilbane, and um, I was invited to be part of this without knowing very much about natural fibers. Um, I was invited because I do a lot of moderation. I've worked in design. But um, this, was a, this was a discovery for me. And what I discovered is that it's such an exciting time right now if you are working in natural fibers, whether it's wool or flax or hemp or natural dyes. Um, it's a very exciting time. And these are five people who are really leading the charge, the conversation here in Oregon. And um, we'll be sharing some of their stories. And our hope is at the end of the hour, we have an hour for the panel, is that um, you'll feel more connected and, and part of a community that is really growing, building, and, um, and um, yeah, that, you, that everybody will feel part of it. So with that, I just, I'll, I'll let everybody introduce themselves, tell them who they are, tell you who they are and what they do, and then we'll get on to questions. You have How to do, do it by, by finger. I can stand here. Do you want to, you want to stand up and I'll click Yeah, I only have We have a few slides. Oh, this is important. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start. Is this on? Yeah, go, go ahead. Okay. I'll start. Um, I'll start. Is Hello? There. there. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Shannon Welsh. I am the founder and director of Pacific Northwest Fiber Shed. Um, I became aware of Fiber Shed um, on my journey of a love of fabric. Um, I'm a knitter, I'm an apparel designer, and I always had more of a background on the design side. And a friend in Colorado contacted me and said, have you heard of Fiber Shed? Um, the work of Rebecca Burgess. And Rebecca Burgess was in doing work in Colorado, living in California, and we started talking. And um, she began an affiliate network, um, and I took over the Pacific Northwest region. Um, I work in collaboration with 51 other networks around the world. And it really is a cooperative network of people who are working. Um, to rebuild our textile system. Um, and when I ventured into Fiber Shed, I knew we were growing wool. I knew we had a history of linen production. I knew we had a ton of makers. We have brands. So I thought, well, that could be pretty easy here. Um, couldn't be a hard thing to start rounding up. Um, in my conversations, I've met an amazing array of people from agricultural producers to makers, and over and over, it came back to it's gone. There is no 
flax growing. Um, there's very few mills doing any sort of textile production domestically. Um, it's a very fractured system. And so I started conversations with people like Angela mm -hmm. and Jared and Jeannie and Jocelyn and started really digging into the history of our region. And um, two things that struck me were in the mid 1900s, we were the wool capital of the world for a period. Um, around that time, we were also um, the leader in flax and linen production in the United States. So we had 18,000 acres of flax growing. Um, we have this rich history of it. And the more I dug into what was happening today, there was a lot happening, but not in production. Um, there is people doing pilot projects, um, a lot of backyard growers, and people who are keeping it alive because they're passionate about it but they don't feel like they're part of a community. So through those conversations, we've started projects and brought the community together. Um, one of them is I began working with Angela and we started Fiber Evolution, which is working to bring flax and linen um, production back to the Willamette Valley. Um, we work a lot within the slides there. Um, <laughs> there you go. Just talking. <laughs> So the fiber shed, what we embrace, or kind of what the network is centered on, and what is the textile system, is the soil to soil system. So fiber shed has a vision to bring these systems back to regional production. So you're growing and producing and putting into production what is growing in your region. Um, currently, because many of these things are missing, we work domestically when we can't do that. Um, we try to do the best practices we can. But we are trying to repair the system, bring it back together um, from working with farmers to working with makers to working with brands, um, spinners. I mean, we have tons of guilds. So the one thing we know is there's a ton happening here, and now um, Fiber Shed's working hard to kind of bring all that back together and connect these systems. So I'm going to pass it over to Angela. Yeah. Yeah, slide <laughs> I slide I have a slide behind. You have a slide behind. Okay. Come on. So I, I'm not really a mic person because I talk loud enough. So <laughs> I'm going to tweet here to hold my spot. Um, so, can you advance, please? Yeah. <coughs> I'm going to give you sort of an overview of how we can uh, bring value to your supply chain through certification, and that's what Oregon Tilt does. And because we have a small accreditation with the Global Organic Textile Standard, that we only have 32 or so. Can you advance, sir? Oh, this is about. That's the face I make when I raft. <laughs> no, it's all right. And this is just an overview of my background, but we can skip because we have more. So right now, this is actually 1,900 certified operations in North America, and 30,000 products on the shelves that have Oregon Tilt logo on it. So we have a, a really broad, broad uh, impact for everything from you know growing the corn in you know Nebraska all the way to making your uh, popcorn. Uh, micro popcorn <laughs> brands <laughs> that we have in, in Indianapolis. So it's like every single aspect of the of the organic chain is covered uh, through certification with Oregon Tilt. And then, can you go to the next one, please? But on the other side of it, um, I run the uh, textile uh, program that specifically hones in on global organic textile standard. And this is like the organic version of food for clothes. Like let's put, or, you know, textile, organic textiles for clothes, and they, and they're, it's all about the certification of every single aspect of the supply chain. From the farmer will be covered by the National Organic Program, and they'll have certified organic cotton, maybe flax, more likely wool, and then we take over once it gets ginned, scoured, once it goes into the writing process, then all the way to the retailer. So every every step that you have, from spinner to the 
actually sending it off to the weaving house to cut and sew, finishing, all of that is covered by the GOT certification. So it rules it all into one. Go ahead. And in this way, it kind of, it, it reduces the risk of your entire supply chain. So a lot of people have, well, let's say a lot of brands, not people in the room, but a lot of brands have a piecemeal certification where you're trying to cover each little spot. Like you have maybe a social compliance side of it, so you have fair trade sewing. And then you have, maybe you want to do blue sign uh, to cover your chemical inputs. And then maybe you'll do, uh, I don't know, textile exchange for organic content claim. And you'll string them all together, and you'll hope that that story will be effectively communicated to the consumer about all of these certifications will then make this product better because they'll understand all of them somehow. With, and it's, it's difficult to weed through all the certifications for sure, but when you just have GOTS on there, it covers everything else. You have the credibility, efficiency in production, innovation, and then also you also have water, environment, uh, social compliance side, best practices. It's, it's one big package. So that's why we chose that one for sure. So this is kind of <laughs> what people, the lengths that people go to explain how many uh, good things can come from this mattress. <laughs> you can have, like Naturepedic, one of our uh, clients, they've got nine certificates. They have 12 recommendations, and it's, it's like on page four of their awards on their website of all the things that their mattresses can do for you just to show the consumer that they're better than everybody else for certified organic. So in that way, GOTS can kind of slice through all of that and, and show you that it, that it can just be one full package for your supply chain. Go ahead. So we do all those aspects. We've got the flax, we have finished product. Everybody involved is, is part of the certification um, project and program. And I would say that um, right now it's grown from, it was like 18 in 2015 that we had certified operations. And then we grew to 23, and now we're at 32. And then overall for the US, it's growing up to uh, 85 yesterday when I checked. And then that has been the fastest growth we've had in the last year. And that's to join 5,000 certified operations around the world. So everything that you're getting that's organic, that's you know, from India or Pakistan and stuff that has the GOTS logo on it, that has all been certified and visited by a third party verifier to make sure that all of those components of the program are actually covered and actually happening there. <laughs> So you can say, oh, this person actually did interview the, the woman that sewed my sheets. Okay, I'm going to buy that product. So a lot of consumer confidence comes with it. So from that, the other hat that I wear, go ahead, is <laughs> Fiber Revolution. And so Shannon and I started this uh, a few years ago, and we grew out of crop last year um, in advance at Lewis Brown Farm, and then we also had a Ralph's place. Ralph's over there. Raise your hand, Ralph. <laughs> yep. <laughs> he did four acres at his place, and we did a half an a acre here, and then we did an eighth of an acre at my farm, and it was all about can we produce high-quality linen for in this region again? Can we do it again? And so we're starting with the seed. So that's where all quality starts. Always starts with the seed. And then going from there, what is going to be the next step? Can we bring back manufacturing here? Can we bring back the processing units? Can we create something that would be a viable, like, regional textile industry? Next one. So then we did a flax harvest just for fun. It was like 98 degrees. Yeah. Horrible. Smoke. <laughs> so hot. <laughs> And then uh, half of this stuff we combined, and so we've got big bags of seed that are going into the next uh, round of flax planting this year. So it'll be 10 acres at Ralph's, uh, another half acre at Lewis Brown, and half of that will be to growing out our F1s for the seed production. And then the, the second half, Shannon and I are going to do a trial on irrigated versus non irrigated and what the fiber quality will be from both of those stands. And then um, we're going to do a little test plot for show at our place, and then we're going to do some demo gardens around at different farms so we can host workshops and stuff about processing flax and the steps involved. I think there's one more. And then, <laughs> in November of last year, we got a, a very generous grant from Patagonia to develop <coughs> like flax in Oregon, and um, we brought down uh, a very amazing guy, Alvin Ehrlich, and he came from Sketch One, and he it grows and has done tons of research into bio um, bass fibers. And so he knows how to hand grade flax for linen, like quality wise. And so we did a video with him, and John shot it, and he and he went and actually graded the historical samples 
that were at the um, Willamette Heritage Society. And it's very exciting. Are you back there? So she spun some of it <laughs> from a different project, and uh, yeah, so it was pretty. It was really great. It was just great to see, to actually see what the great quality we could have historically grown here in Oregon, and then compare that to what we can grow now. And, and he was like, "This stuff is good." <laughs> so we're thrilled. Yeah. So that's our. That's what we're currently up to. <laughs> Hi everybody, I do need a mic. <laughs> uh, my name is Jared Flood. I'm a founder of Brooklyn Tweed. Um, Brooklyn Tweed's a yarn company and knitwear design company. We're, we're based here in Portland. We're just right across the river. Uh, we started in New York, hence our, our name, Brooklyn Tweed. Um, have been in Portland for about three years. I'm a Northwest native, so it was kind of coming home for me. Um, yeah, what we do, uh, we're about not eight years old uh, as far as a company, and I, my background's in clothing design, knitwear design. I was uh, working as a knitwear designer in New York and sort of an outsider into the hand knitting market, the, the hand making market, and uh, was kind of just curious about where things come from, how yarn is made, uh, you know, how this industry works, and... Um, decided I might want to try making some yarn here in the U.S. And I was uh, just thinking that, that you know, I, I didn't know whether or not that was possible. Um, so we, <laughs> it is possible. Um, so yeah, spent, spent a few years putting together a domestic supply chain to create uh, yarns that are sourced here in the U.S., spun in the U.S., dyed in the U.S., and um, designed with in the U.S. So it's been quite an amazing ride. My, my presentation is completely pic pictures, just to show you some, some of the things that we do. So we work with ranchers in the, in, the, in the middle of the country, Montana, South Dakota, Colorado, the areas where wool is grown um, sort of at a commercial scale. And w one thing that's different about what we're doing as a yarn company is that we're using breed-specific wool. So a lot of people don't know that wool is um, like, like wine. There's, there's a lot of different, there, there are a lot of different breeds of wool and all those different breeds have different histories, different geographies in the world that they come from where they've evolved over hundreds of years. Um, and that means that the fleece that grow on these different breeds have different qualities. And to me, I, I found that very interesting um, I, I'm a hand spinner as well, so as a hand spinner, you're basically making yarn in the same way a, a machine makes yarn, but you're getting to, you know, all those fibers run through your fingers. And when I started spinning, I started really being kind of amazed at how different, you know, wool is. And we, we see 100% wool in a lot of places. Well, <laughs> not even that anymore so much, but um, to, to really know that that's just the beginning and there's more to wool than, than just 100% wool. So um, when I started the company in 2009, when I started kind of doing the research, found that there were, you know, there, there still was an opportunity to be able to get wool at, prior to it being mixed into a, a broader wool pool, which is what happens with most of the wool that's grown here and everywhere else, is that it's sorted mostly for fineness and, and softness and blended together. But what's lost is some of these unique traits um, that are present in a specific breed. So we work with breeds that you may have never heard of before. Some of you may have heard of them. Rambouillet, Targi, Columbia. Some, um, I have an expert next to me who, who knows about <laughs> some of these breeds that's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, yeah. And... Yeah, it's been a really interesting road the um, last nine years. Um, I think we're, as I said, we, we operate in the hand-making community, the hand-knitting community, and I feel really lucky to be in a community where I think the, the average consumer is a little bit more wired towards wanting to know more about their materials, where they come from. Um, I mean, if you think about hand knitters, they spend 100 hours perhaps with, you know, that that strand of yarn going through their fingers, they're really aware of what different qualities fiber can have. And so um, we, you know, I wanted to start a company that looked a little bit different than what you might expect when you think about hand knitting. Um, I think a lot of people have certain um, stereotypes about 
who knitters are and what hand knitting can be and how it can look. And it's been really fun to challenge some of those stereotypes and at the same time be um, learning an incredible amount along the way and um, putting together, at this point we have two going on three domestic supply chains that from start to finish are completely happening here and are making a really high quality product that um, we can give to knitters that are, uh, we work with wool exclusively because we're wool obsessed at Brooklyn Tweed. Um, happily, happily <laughs> so. It's, it really is a miracle fiber and I, I'm amazed at you know all the technological advances in textiles and fabric production, but there's still no way to recreate wool and and the things that wool can do. And I feel like I'm in church now, <laughs> um, the the wool church. But anyway, so yeah, so that's that's what we do at Brooklyn Tweed, and um, and it's been you know I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that tonight, but that's kind of my, my two-minute intro about what we're doing and who I am. So really um, grateful that you're all here tonight. It's exciting to me to see a room full of people who are interested in hearing about this stuff because it does sometimes seem like a, uh, an uphill battle when we're, we're talking about um, education, textile education, um, slowing down, slower, slowing the fashion world down, um, learning to appreciate making things by hand, um, connecting with uh, traditions that have been part of human civilization growing from, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I feel um, it's a really interesting place to be working and exploring and um, exploring new ideas. I'm excited to see you all here tonight. So thanks for coming. Do you have a, if you want to click it yourself, you can. Well, you can, can click it. Okay. <laughs> Do I need this? Can you guys hear? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I have an outside voice. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to have a slideshow? You do. Oh, great. And then I'll just go like that. Okay. <laughs> so, and you said a lot of fun things there, Jared, but the one that you just said that reminded me, I have to say this, about 2004 or so on my journey of value-added work in wool. The challenges were so huge. And I said in a work in a group situation one day, happened to be a group of conservation minded people. And I said, Yeah, I feel like the salmon, I feel like the salmon swimming upstream. I feel like the salmon swimming upstream. And a, a, a biologist happened to be in there that said, yes, Jeannie, but you're lucky because only dead salmon go down. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, if you look right here, it says salmon are the measurement of well-being for all life in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And salmon happen to be our story. So from a 160-acre homestead claim to an empire, the Imperial Stop Ranch story begins in 1852 on the Oregon Trail when a family coming west with an ox cart had a son on the way. They named him Richard Hinton. He was born, in the, he was born on, the, on the way west. He grew up in the Willamette Valley. That was the promised land where everybody, the settlers, came. They skipped right through that harsh interior desert country. Nobody wanted to go there, right? Over here you had soil. <laughs> <laughs> that started for me. And lots of water and grass. But Richard Henson grew up here seeing it become overcrowded, overpopulated. He dreamed of being a stockman, not a farmer. And so he went east of the mountains in, when he was 19 years old, 1871, with his saddle horse, his pack horse, and his six gun strapped on. <laughs> and he was one of the first two white settlers in that part of North Central Oregon in the interior. He filed on a 160 acre homestead claim. By the way, that guy on the horse was not him, that's our son. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bringing him over the ridge, coming in for sure. But he built an empire that became Oregon's largest individually owned land and livestock holdings. And when wool was king in this part of the country, uh, Imperial Stock Ranch was the largest uh, sheep operation, one of the largest in the American West. I've documented 35,000 head of sheep on the tax rolls, but of course, no one ever told the revenues the truth. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got to pay taxes on so. Oral histories give us about double that number. He built an empire on sheep, cattle, grain, and hay production, and he named it the Imperial Stock Ranch. So uh, this is our 147th continuous year of producing sheep, cattle, grains, and hay. That diversity is what helped him succeed when many homesteaders failed. 
And today we keep this going on. We recognize we're temporary stewards of these resources. It's simply our turn to tend the land. And so it all begins with the soil. Our headquarters are a National Historic District. We're the only ranch in Oregon with that designation that's still operating. Um, we're about 22 acres of grounds and buildings, so some of you have been there. Others may come one day for a tour. Uh, it's a great walking tour because all of our significant structures and every acre we farm, up to 5,000 acres, all the cropland was established by young Richard Hinton with a horse and a plow. <laughs> we benefit every day from what he established. And every building we operate out of, he created before, before engines were invented. It's a, great, it's a great walking tour. Go ahead. So all the harvests sold as commodities and, um, for about 130 years. That's how you do things in agriculture. We were focused on stewardship of the grasslands since uh, I've known my husband. He has wanted to see the earth win. That's always been his mission because all we have to do is look around us and we see the earth lose. So since the 80s, he was really focused on implementing leading practices um, in management of both cropland and grasslands and the grazing animals who are vital to stimulating grasses to improve the health of the watershed. And his actions facilitated record numbers of salmon <laughs> returning to our creeks to spawn. And he became a leader in these practices both regionally and nationally. In the 1990s, there were huge challenges for the sheep industry in America between 96 and 2000, in just a four-year period. This is an American sheep industry statistic, probably the most powerful statistic I ever give. 26,000 sheep producers in America went out of business. Why? We had a changing set of regulations, factors. We saw the offshoring um, in a huge way loss of textile infrastructure. We have approximately 7% of the um, uh, textile infrastructure left in America we once had, and we're still in a shrinking phase. We lost three mills in the last 12 months. We had consolidation in our food system. We're all aware of that. One buyer left for land in all of Western America. They were importing heavily. That pressed down the lamb price. So lamb was 50 cents a pound in 1999. And predators. We were losing 40% of the lambs born and turned out in 1999 to predator losses. So without predator support, um, with no infrastructure for textiles, poor lamb price, and in some cases, complete inability to sell the wool, that's what was uh, making the changes. Uh, and so move back one, can you? So what did I say? Oh, um, so similar to the, my husband said to me, we called up our wool buyer in the spring of 99 after shearing and said, Hi, Dave, how's the weather at your place? What's the price of wool this year? What will you give us? He said, I'm sorry, folks. We're not buying wool. We're closing our processing and going offshore like everybody else. We're not buying wool anymore. We didn't know what to do with that comment because we had only known selling the wool to that company for 100 years. What do you do? You can't sell anymore. So we had poor lamb price, we were getting killed by predators. My husband said either we find our own markets for what the sheep have given us and giving man for 10,000 years, or they're gone off this ranch. And so we began a new journey, a new twist to an old story. Um, in parallel, I started on the wool and my husband said, work on the meat, that's where the money is. You know, those men are like so practical. <laughs> you know, they're so logical. And he's always, everything has to pencil. So he's the idea guy, and I'm the worker bee, right? Here's the problem, go fix it. And so, in parallel, we began building a direct-to-chef program. You may have met Damien from Breakside Growing out there that did the lamb tonight, and thank I guess they're gone, you know, we can't thank him, but I began uh, cold calling my first restaurant, and we have never sold lamb in the commodity market since 1999. We have a family of chefs who are truly our family, who take those animals that we have known from birth to finish, that have only known our voices and our hands. We process as a certified humane facility, and our chefs take that harvest and prepare it for their customers. It's a regional system. 
In this picture, I'm wearing a lambskin vest. It's actually hanging back there. All that display you saw is my archives, starting on the left, from the earliest things I did with one woolen spun yarn, with local textile artists doing the knitting, the weaving, the cut and sew, creating a finished something to sell. I hoped maybe somebody would buy. And then it evolves through to some of the more uh, commercial scale things that we did. So we began the food program. Let's go ahead and advance. Um, I didn't know if we could sell anything, but I took the essence of who we were and what we did on the land because that was the most important life that we had. Soil, water, grasses, grazing animals, sunlight. Give you food, clothing, shelter, life to man. Thousands of years. If we destroy the resource, we destroy life on the planet. That is our life, is to steward the resources. And so, I put those together, put it in our marketing messages and packaging. Didn't hire anybody in marketing. Didn't know anything about what I was doing. I just used CD of Pants logic and was determined to sell it. Right? And that's how we did it. So, I tied it to the origins of the products, and in an era of outsourcing and disconnect, we brought traceability and accountability since 2000. Go ahead. Ultimately, we were in multiple market channels, actually five. The needle arts and hand knit market, production yarn to brands, keep going, apparel and accessories, keep going. All those photos hold were shot inside historic buildings that have been in place since the 1800s. We did home goods and knits, home goods and wovens, and hold right there. I put together a supply chain starting as close to home as we could, support each other, our neighbors. I hired local textile artists to knit, to weave, to cut and sew. And as I was pushed up finally by designers, I had to expand that to commercial sale weaving and knitting. I actually, with my hand weavers, I finally said to them, look, I'm just going to have your meals delivered. You just stay at the loom <laughs> until the orders are done, okay? And I'll just bring you the food. And I kind of wore them out to where they kind of said, Jeannie, here, call these people. <laughs> but um, we really did start close to home and evolve. It's been an amazing journey, but without the men and women that started close, helping mentor me, and showing us the way. We would never have graduated in scale and connected, not only urban and rural. I think probably the greatest thing this thing did, this whole program for the last almost 20 years, is we used to think we were different than those folks in Portland. You know, we probably vote differently, right? We saw our differences. But the day I started bringing lamb and beef to the back door of the restaurant and yarn to the shop, I need you. Because if I don't have you, we're out of business. It became real to us, not just a commodity that went into an anonymous market. And on the flip side, you need me. Because we bring you food and clothes and shelter. And so we began to change our focus to how much we're alike and in common instead of how we're different. And so we've strengthened urban and rural. I like to say there is no more. I hate that word bridge. You know, we're all in this together. And we've done the same thing with the East and West. But I was committed to never crossing an ocean. <laughs> when I do cross an ocean, I buy local cultural things, okay? But America has to stay strong in order to continue with our DNA of helping others around the world. And we need our textiles. They help build this country. And they are as important to our culture and country today as they've ever been. Okay. From farm to fork and ranch to runway, we scaled up while maintaining our intimate connection to land and animals. We became the farmer's market of textiles in the U.S. We attracted brand partners like Ralph Lauren, J. Crew, Ethan Allen, interest from companies across fashion, like Eileen Fisher, to sports, like Under Armour, to outdoor recreation, like Patagonia. Keep going. God made a farmer and sent him his harvest to the Olympics. Against great odds, we built a successful yarn, fabric, and finished goods business with products and mar market channels. 2012, done the London of Games, you may all remember, there was an uproar over the Chinese-made Olympic uniforms. Of course, everybody in the uproar were wearing garments made offshore. <laughs> but it all of a sudden was not okay for our U.S. team to be wearing things made elsewhere. Why can't we do that in America? And so, right during the Games, Ralph Lauren put an army on the ground to figure out, could they make it in America and with who? 
and probably every manufacturer left in this country got a call. <laughs> I sold my heart out when that call came in. I call it the call. <laughs> and um, they visited us, and six months later we got the order of our life, and then they made us the face of their Made in America Olympic uniforms. So kind of the rest is history. I stopped counting at 200 companies who contacted us who wanted to work in America with an American yarn. It was overwhelming, and it changed our life as remote, rural, ranching folks. I needed a full-time person to answer the emails, but I did my best. In 2017, hold on right there. In 2017, and I won't go into this unless someone asks questions, we became the first ranch in America. Angela just did a beautiful presentation. I really want Oregon Tilt to become a certifier of the RWS, the Responsible Wool Standard. The broadest and deepest standard I know that crosses land management Soil management, water, pesticides, forage, combined with animal husbandry best practices, with a huge stakeholder involvement, four years of development, and a complete content control, uh, whatever you get the right words to, the trail. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, once it comes off the ranches, then it goes through to your product. An incredible program. And uh, we became the first ranch in the world certified under that standard. Go ahead. And I might say we never had to change one practice yeah. to do it. All we had to do was a few extra pieces of paperwork. <laughs> For the Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games of Korea that we just had, Imperial Stocker Ranch was again one of the stories. You may have seen that uh, in the paper. You may have seen it on KGW. But Ralph Lauren chose National Spinning Company's branded yarn program, which we did with them in early 15, the Imperial Stock Ranch American Marine Think Food. For the opening and closing knit where they're back there, you're welcome to get your photo with them. Go ahead. <laughs> and so she has been answering the call for thousands of years, providing warmth, shelter, and sustenance. Shelter, great word, I hear it. <laughs> to humankind. Go ahead. We are all called to honor these timeless gifts. Go ahead. So the opportunity lies ahead of us, working as close together as we can to build supply chains regionally and domestically. We strengthen partnerships and relationships. We build community. We're stronger together when facing adversity. We support producers through longer term commitments. Um, we support brands through accountability and uh, holding off that risk. And we deliver something transparent with real meaning, brand loyalty, and a better footprint for all. That's what we can deliver with a regional system. Wow. Okay. A thorough introduction. And Jocelyn, you make maps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is on. Um, I'm so glad that you went ahead of me, even though it's a very hard act to follow. Um, you talk a lot about um, the, all of the practices and all of the things that EcoTrust believes in. So, um, so I work for EcoTrust. Thank you for coming to our home. This is our building. Thank you. Um, and we love to host events like this here. Um, it makes it feel like a really dynamic um, place to work, which is really exciting. You can go to the next slide. So um, EcoTrust is an organization. We're based right here in Portland. And um, we focus on the Pacific Northwest. And we work to advance social equity, economic opportunity, and environmental well-being. We make maps and software apps. We um, uh, 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 work with we connect farmers and fishermen to uh, local eaters and we manage forests and investment funds we do a lot of things but we believe in um, bridging the rural urban divide we believe in taking care of the land and we believe that in taking care of the land you can make a living and you can do it well and uh, what Jeannie talked about in terms of salmon uh, we work we, in the Pacific Northwest, but what we like to think of as um, salmon nation. So anywhere that salmon have run, um, Pacific salmon. <laughs> uh, we also work in, uh, <laughs> I mean, Atlantic salmon are great. <laughs> they just don't live here. Um, I, uh, we tend to work in forestry, fisheries, and food and farms. 
I am a, a map maker and a data analyst for EcoTrust. Um, and so what I do is I look at the data and I find patterns that tell us where good things are happening on the landscape that we can maybe replicate. And I also look at um, places where things are not going well. And maybe there's um, a possibility for us to invest time or resources or money or effort into that location and help to build the world that we um, collectively want to see, a world where um, the people who are making a living off the land um, can make that living and they can treat the land well and treat the people working on the land well. I'm also a knitter. And with the knitting and the pattern finding, I really noticed the um, similarities that the food system and the fiber system face. Go to the next one. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, this is our blueprint for a resilient regional food economy. And we do a lot of work in food. This is sort of just one piece. But we support the infrastructure, that middle piece. And we work to um, uh, bring the uh, ag of the middle, mid-scale farms that are ready to scale up um, but having trouble, um, help them um, uh, help big buyers source from them. And right now we focus on institutions, schools, hospitals, that sort of thing. Um, and we, do, we hope that those big buyers, that the money they can put into the system will drive change up the supply chain. So if they're creating demand, this? then those mid-scale farms, mid-scale producers can um, use that investment to scale up. Mid-scale farms, small-scale farms, face enormous barriers trying to move from the um, farmer's market uh, CSA model into an industrial ag world. There's a huge barrier there. Go ahead. Oh, not you. you. <laughs> Just point over there. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, we did this um, gap analysis of the food system in Oregon. And this is uh, in part what inspired that um, uh, approach that I showed you in the previous slide. So we wondered, as we, we work with all these farms, everybody, everybody in Portland wants to eat local. There's a huge demand for it. We have a ton of farms. We are blessed in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest with um, just an amazing landscape <coughs> for farming. But we import most of the food that we eat. We export most of the food that we produce. Why is that? So um, we started to ask questions about, is it, a, uh, is it a spatial thing? Is it just that things aren't lining up on the landscape? Um, and the answer, there's a lot of nuance in that answer, but it sort of came down to infrastructure. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and so we uh, started putting our money where our mouth is. We also, Ecotrust acts as sort of a, um, we do a, <laughs> I keep coming about this, we do a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, but we like to figure out how to invest in the future that we want to see. How do we build this infrastructure? How do we connect producers with uh, the people who want to buy their food and get them the capital that they need to expand? So, next one. Inspired by that um, work that our uh, food and farms team has done, that uh, different groups have done, what I really want to do is first uh, build a map. Uh, build a map uh, that is open and accessible to everybody, that is searchable, that uh, people can edit and add to. This is a, a system that um, is not captured uh, really anywhere uh, in terms of you know, a, a data set that is just readily available. Um, then I'd like to do, uh, and this is all um, in partnership with Fibershed. We've been talking about this for a long time. <laughs> uh, then do a, a gap analysis. So what's missing on the landscape? Where is it missing? What scale does it need to be at? What's the story there? Who is benefiting and who is not benefiting from the system right now? And then the third thing would, it to, would be to invest. Invest in those pinch points, invest in those gaps, figure out how to create a fiber system that is resilient, that is equitable, and in line with the food system that EcoTrust is working to build right now. Um, and all of these people are doing that work. Um, and EcoTrust hopes that we can sort of use what we've learned in the food system, use what we know about investing, uh, impact investing, to support that work. So those are very dense introductions. <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, that was great. And I, I say that with 
in with awe and respect. I mean, really, these are people who I, this is an hour is not enough. We need a semester or a year in, you know, the um, natural fiber world 101. Um, thank you for sharing all that, because that gives us context for the rest of our conversation. And um, I'm just going to go back to one of the things that struck me when I first met Sh Shannon was um, just learning about the prominence of flax in Oregon's history, and really beginning with Lewis and Clark in the journals, you know, recording native uses, and going on through World War II, and um, and with support of the USDA, it really was it, it meant something um, here in Oregon, and then it just disappeared. And uh, you know, I, I guess the question that I have for you, Shannon, is like, how does that happen, and why is it not so simple? I mean, clearly. You have a passionate group of five. You can only imagine the army that's behind them that, that wants to bring this back. Why is it not so simple? Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, one thing, oh, the reasons it went away, um, there's multiple reasons, but um, right around the same time, a lot of the flax was going to the war efforts. Um, nylon and synthetics came around. Um, and we kind of, over time, we were doing more overseas. And over time, it's went away to the point where we can't access seed. We can't get fiber flax seed. Um, we have nowhere to process it. We don't have the equipment to harvest it. We have... Now I'm going to just ask one question. So my, my 13 year old say, what do you mean you can't get seed? And I'm sure a lot of people in, the, in here understand that why, but I, I, I'm gonna ask it. Why can't we get seed? Oh. <laughs> um, here. Yeah, it hasn't been growing, and it also, um, it hasn't been growing for so long that we have to develop, seed doesn't, re it's once a year. <laughs> you get a little bit of seed off a crop and we have to build it back up. We also are working with a seed breeder to develop our own varieties of seed. Um, most of the seed is coming from Europe and there's a lot to that. You can't just call up and order as much seed as you want over here and there's a lot of every, what I realized was I wanted to make fabric. Like that's, <laughs> that's I wanna make fabric. And I have to work on developing seed. And then we have the, you know, so it's, we've had moments of like, wait a minute, what? Like, we want, so it's, we've lost it to the point where we really are rebuilding it back to the seed. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. back to the very, and it's slow. Mm -hmm. It's a once a year crop. Although Ralph had success, the flax up here, um, some of it he pulled today, but that's an overwinter crop from his field. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, maybe we can get it twice a year. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lots of, we're playing with mm -hmm. it. It's a pilot project. It's, there's just a lot yeah. of stuff, a lot of pieces to it. And what about the issues of harvest? Once you actually do grow it, what, what are the, the issues of harvest? <laughs> right now, the only way to harvest is with your hands, <laughs> hand harvest. And, um, we have, we worked with Alvin Ulrich from, um, he owns Biolin Research in Sus Saskatchewan. And um, he gave us some alternative ideas of way we might be able to harvest it. But all the equipment, we don't have that equipment anymore. We have dug and dug and dug. And it's just, it's specialized equipment because we haven't been growing it, we don't have it. So. Mm -hmm. It's all in Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. I might yeah. offer something Go for it, yeah. from an agriculture, and, and Ralph, you, you might too. I, I can't speak to flax necessarily, but I know that um, the regulation within agriculture on seed is not a simple topic. Like many of our seeds in wheat and grains were uh, in the public domain, controlled by our land-grant universities, and now those have been taken over by public corporations who control the seed. Right? It changes your access as a farmer to seed. So if a crop has not been, and then every landowner has to figure out by the pencil how they can make the most money off the land. 
Of course, you also have to be smart and know that if your land is not maintaining and improving, your longevity is limited. Mm -hmm. So you have to assure the health of the soil in the future. But there are so many factors that go into managing cropland and the seed, and then the machinery and the infrastructure, if it's not something that is at scale, yeah. then it has gone out of, you can't go down to the John Deere dealer and get what you need to get flax harvested. Mm -hmm. right? Because the masses are not doing it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a complicated issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, so what makes you hopeful that this is possible? Because I said there's a lot of barriers, clearly. They grew 18,000 acres. <laughs> yeah. In 1945, it can come back. It can absolutely come back. Okay. It's yeah. just the importation of equipment into the country. It's not, I don't know that it's much more than having the gumption to go and find that stuff, talk them into selling it to you, getting out on a ship, unload it out in the port and then drive it over to your farm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like there's so many layers to it, but that's how we advance in all the agricultural crops that we decide we're going to go into, but mm -hmm. don't necessarily have already producing in the U.S. We're yeah. Like, yeah, we're going to really go into this new one, and then we find out that the harvesting equipment is so specialized they don't make it anywhere. Okay, we're going to have to import it from Canada. We're going to have to bring it in from this place and stuff. So it's, it's, I think that's the biggest hurdle for us, but seed is because we can't, well, because the Belgians won't give up that much seed to us, <laughs> I don't <laughs> like, figure out how we're going to also import a little bit from them and then build our base here. And the yeah. replication takes so long yeah, that, like that that years. is, four, yeah, years. four yeah. or five years is before we could actually have enough of a new variety to plant out into farm trials. So it's, um, it's, a, pro it's a big process. I mean, none mm -hmm. of these, none of the things you eat right now were like instantaneous, uh -huh. like, you know, nothing. Like yeah. the little bit, you know, carrots, everything, you, all the things you like, <laughs> everything you like <laughs> was not just like all of a sudden it was on the side of the road and someone went and picked it and harvested some seed and grew it out again. It doesn't, it's like, they've been developed for so many years through so many different programs to get that kind of quality and the taste and the size and the maturity and everything. Yeah. So that's the same thing with flax. Yeah. yeah. I have a question for you guys too. Um, I think one thing that I don't know much about seed so much working on the wool side, but um, one thing that I, I'm curious to, to ask you about too is um, I think we're the first, whenever we talk about challenges, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is the equipment and the, the, the facility. Um, and when you get that, but there's still one major piece missing, which is the knowledge. And I think that that's one thing that we are focusing on and, and really paying attention to is, well, there are these mills that are, are still you know, holding on or they're, they're being held on to because there's a family legacy there um, and people have a passion to continue some, uh, a tradition that has been started for multiple generations in most of these cases that are still viable. Um, what about the, is there, is there a knowledge piece too? Once that equipment's available, how do, who knows how to, to use it and, and how do we, how do we educate uh, another generation, especially at this time when it's hard to sort of pitch a, a ag job maybe to a millennials? <laughs> Let alone manufacturing. <laughs> And then you have to find parts. And then you got to find parts. You know, that's or you got to make them. Well, right. also, flax is a long line. So long line flax is where you get the high quality fiber that made this garment. <laughs> um, that's a really specialized crop to yeah. harvest, to red, the process. So a lot of things we've been working with, and a big piece of fiber shed is educating, um, looking to people like Jeannie Carver and Ralph and people who have um, experience with this and passing knowledge down and inspiring the younger generation. So it's really, <coughs> you're rebuilding that in a way too. Are our land grant colleges, are you reaching connection with them yet on that too? Yeah, they're hosting most of the land uh, trials that we're doing for great, the seat. Great. And then on the other side of it, they have an agricultural engineering department and they had created in 1955 the, the only flax puller that was ever out there and it, it resides right now at the Yamhill Historical Society. You can go see it. It's <laughs> light blue. It's really cute and it's tiny. It's self-driving. It's not propelled. It's not tractor propelled and um, they developed that and then right then the entire market bottomed out. All the Belgium 
you know, factories came back online after the, the war. They hadn't graded flax at all in the U.S. because they had one customer, which was the military, and they didn't care what quality it was, just that you had a lot of it. And yet Belgium had an entire grading system like they do for wool, and so we couldn't compete. There wasn't, you know, they, they had all the infrastructure, and we had a small amount of it. So that's where it stopped. You had one, there was one harvester. It was still functioning in 2002, I think it was, yeah. when they did the last flax trial for um, fiber flax in Klamath Falls with, um, in association with OSU. And then it was parked and then never run again. So we asked if we could use it. <laughs> we fix it up and use it. Yeah, but we couldn't find anybody to work on it. So it's exactly how it all comes around. Like we would have to import a millwright from Europe. We'd have to get someone from Czechoslovakia to come and live in the U.S. for a couple years and, you know, sponsor their visa to be able to run this kind of mill because there isn't anyone that runs it. Mm -hmm. And if, I, I think Jared and I were talking about this before. Like if you ever visit a wool mill in the U.S., you've got one boss Carter. He's the dude that runs the parts. <laughs> And he's called the boss because he knows everything about that machine from 1895 or whatever. And it's and every single part of it. And if anything breaks, he makes it and stuff. He is a very prickly person to work with. <laughs> Hands down, for every single boss card I've ever met, prickly person. And so, and he's getting older in age, right? He's right, like that's six, the problem. 65 or yeah, so, right. and he keeps talking about retiring, but nobody wants him to retire because there's no one to take his place. And, there, and the company is always trying to find some younger person to apprentice under the boss carter. They don't last. They don't last <laughs> because it's too prickly. So it's really, it's difficult to pass on that kind of information and that kind of knowledge when there's just one person in like a whole region that is that person. So it's, yeah, it's a huge challenge. And so inspiring people to go into manufacturing when they have all these tech jobs to choose from, it's really, it's difficult, but it's, it's well worth it if anybody in the room wants to talk about their future yeah. career endeavors. Well, and I'm, I'm curious, I mean, that's a great segue to my next question, which is for Jared, which is really, you came into this, you, you know, you were a knitting entrepreneur, you were a maker who entered this world really knowing not anything. It, this is, you explain this. You, you explain this to me, I'm not saying this to you. You tell me this beforehand, but, so I, ha, can you talk a little bit about the experience of figuring things out and, you know, what were the surprises or, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny that I, I do say that I came into this with no knowledge. I actually, I, I've, looking back, that's actually been something that I think ha has helped because I, I didn't know the status quo or, or how this all works. And so for me, you know, I honestly came into the industry thinking that every yarn company makes yarn this way and, and was, you know, that that rain cloud came over and, and nobody's making yarn this way. But at that point, by the time having that realization, having gotten in deep enough to say, well, I've, I can see that it could be done. It's just really, really hard. Um, and, but I, I would say that prob probably the reason we've been able to do what we're, what we're doing is completely people driven. Um, we've been, we work with two historic mills in New England that our multi-generation um, family businesses that are doing this as the family family legacy. So it's not that you, one, our mill in New Hampshire, Harrisville, in Harrisville, New Hampshire, you know their their son who's in his early 30s is now learning sort of to run the business and um, and is thinking ahead about training people who are younger and they they actually do have a program there where there are younger people learning from the boss the prickly boss carter um and you know and, and that's really exciting but the the driving force there is not financial it's it's more of a moral mission or a um and we we see that with ranchers as well <laughs> here's a great example um where the money is not necessarily in the fiber the money might be in the meat but the fiber is something that is part of that family's legacy or um you know still paying attention to the quality of that fiber is something that is important to them and that that's something that they're personally bringing to the process so um i think Creativity is the only way forward, and that's part, probably why I found this project so intriguing and interesting because it's a puzzle to solve, and there there wasn't sort of a way to do it that that was being done, um, and it's a tenuous 
chain. There's, there's not that many people who can do what, what we need them to do, but there obviously are a few. And when, when you're able to show you know, knitters in a community, in, in our case, in, in our industry, that, that this can be done, we've noticed that there becomes more interest in it. Um, that by showing and, and telling that story and educating people, that people realize they want to support something they didn't even know they, th that was possible to support. So I think when it comes, you know, we can, we, we can easily spiral down into a very dark place up here <laughs> talking about, you know, where it's going or, or you know, the continued decline of uh, a once great industry, which, you know, I, I know is hard to listen to um, when we have a room full of people who are interested in, in saying, how can we move forward? Um, and education, but, but creativity is, is really, for me, the only answer um, because you need to constantly be asking yourself, how else could we figure this out? How else could we do this? Because the way that seemed so logical is there's not, a, there's not actually a, a footpath there. So um, that's motivating too, because you know, creative people like to rise to that challenge. And there's something energizing, I think, about, um, at least for me, there's something energizing about pushing into an area that is, is new and unexplored. And while it's terrifying and scary and hard, it's also, um, it's also really motivating and it pushes forward. And you, you find you make connections with people that really are meaningful. And, and those connections, I think we'd all agree that the, the people connections are really where the energy from this is coming from. <laughs> Well, I think, I think um, there are people feel that in your brand. You know, you're, you're living that through your brand right now and all that you're doing with Thanks. Brooklyn Tweed. So. Um, Jeannie, you talked about, when we, when we spoke on the phone before the session, I mean, you talked about this vertical system. Really, that's your dream, to be able to pull product all the way through. And what does that look like here in the Pacific Northwest or in the U.S.? What, what's it, describe your hope and dream. Well... There's some great models out there that work in food. I think the way we succeed, whether it's neighbor to neighbor, or business to business, um, or with a supply chain, is um, we, have to, we have to work together to get stronger. We have to find ways to have connections that make work for each person involved. Whether it's your neighbor, working together on a project, or it's you and another business. But working together is really important. And in the food system, since we started this journey in parallel almost 20 years ago, it was never different for us because it's all a sunlight harvest. It's just a different form of protein. Mm -hmm. You eat it or you wear it, right? And so where in the food system, we have watched it work, where the processor and the grower and the restaurant or the retail outlet are intricately tied to make this work. So the better they do, the more they pull product through, the more that helps you as a producer grower and the more that helps the processor because they're there just doing that piece. In the food system, it's a very short chain and it's easier to build a strong regional system. When we went, what I found in the fiber though, was that I didn't have any mills right here. And, and in fact, it's really difficult for mills to make it because everything has to be at a certain scale, a certain minimum, or it costs them money rather than making them money to produce a run of fabric or a run of yarn or even a lot of washing wool, just getting the dirt and grease out. All those steps which there's a lot more than in the food system in general, have to be at a certain scale. And also, you can have the greatest idea or product in the world, which don't let me forget to say, in almost all these challenges, our greatest challenge is our mindset. Mm -hmm. For growers, right? Uh, mindset changes are the greatest challenge that we have. You know, um, So that's the first step. But once you have the mindset change and the thing... You, you look at something differently, then things are more possible. And it also helps to be damn stubborn. <laughs> but um, 
the textile supply chain is in so many pieces. We're so separated. We're so silent. We are not connected. The washer works so independently, that's all they do is this, and that's all they see. The spitter is pretty much the same thing. Stock dyeing and yarn dyeing, same thing. We do have some mills that are vertically integrated. They see the whole process. But in, in general, the textile supply chain is very segmented. And they don't share their information. They don't tell you what, you get a bill, but you don't know what their real costs are, what their margins are at the spinning mill. You don't know what the margins are at the dyeing level, the weaving facility, finishing, cut and sew. You don't know. So you've got this really complicated chain. And I look, I'm, I'm going to use the name. There's a company here in Portland. Um, there's a company here in Portland. Well, so let me, so I'll get, get back to that. With the local people where I started, with the regional, for the weavers or a knitter or a felter or anyone I was going to work with, we sat together. We were like family. What will you, what will you charge me to do this? It needs to be worth your time. You give me a price. So you gave me a price. Okay, what will you charge to do this part? Okay, I've got that. And then I knew what my production costs are, so I know what I have to get for the fiber to make them, you know. So you add all that together, and now I have a price to sell to, to you, who's the customer. And of course, if you can't make it work as a retailer and pull the raw material through, we all fail. So the retailer is really key to pulling everything through, through from producer through the whole supply chain. Okay. So we made it work in a small way with local people. But when you get into a commercial scale, we are disconnected. There isn't that connection anymore. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, there's a company here in Portland called Sustainable Harvest. Are any of you familiar with Sustainable Harvest? Let's Talk Coffee. Let's Talk Coffee model. This model has become so successful where they work, the coffee growers themselves, the first step processor, and each step, along with the wholesaler retailers, come together every year and meet in general, and then meet as broken out, they have allowance to do their vertic that vertical supply chain, meets together every, every piece of it, mm -hmm. together each year. Because the success of the retailer means the success of the grower, because they're gonna keep filling the pipeline. Mm -hmm. The same thing for the processors, each step, the roasters, each step's key. So uh, for three years, I've been dreaming of, let's talk wool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's talk wool. Let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Be the growers with you the, the scouring, and you the spinning, and you the yeah. dyeing, and you the knitting, and you the retailer. If we had a family, and we worked together, and we made multi-year commitments. And we were willing to be so transparent, we shared our margins. Yeah, exactly. You have to get a fair return. You do, you do, you do, you do. Any piece mm -hmm. in there that's broken is a problem. Mm -hmm. I don't see why that's not possible, except for mindsets. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in an industry of ranching. You ever been around very many sheep herders? <laughs> <laughs> you talk about a stubborn crowd. <laughs> All right, we got it. We've been doing it this way for three, no, 16 generations. <laughs> 16. <laughs> right? And um, that sounds pretty weird to me, right? So, so you have this mindset change to overcome, and the key is the consumer and the brands. Because if it works for them, and the growers see that, they're in. And if we can have and build some successful models, then you make, a diff then you make change, mm -hmm. like what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So we have to change the mindset. So a lot of the growers need to have an open mind toward flax on their land, yeah. right? Yeah. When, when it hasn't been there for forever, they're like, nobody grows that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> now, An Angela, you have traveled the world certifying um, product and if you have an eye on models I mean Jeannie's talking about yeah. what her dream is for here but you've seen models mm -hmm. around the globe I mean you've just come back from Dubai, Dubai or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean um, <Mildly> <laughs> yeah so I mean you have 
some reference to pull from in terms of what works and what doesn't, or what are the models that you think could be applied here, or what makes Oregon's unique? Um, I'm just curious, given your worldview. Um, yeah, what we can do here to yeah. capitalize on. Just building on Jeannie's dream. <laughs> you know, I will say we started one. We had it. We had the growers. We had the scour top maker, spinning, dyeing, knitter, and the brand. We had it. We had it. We worked that. And then some political things came along and it blew apart. We had, with a major influencer, could have really led that. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, politics and some key elections things that happened blew that out. But I really believe that that's possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. I think um, I, I was in Dubai last week for a uh, cotton inspector's training. They do not grow cotton in Dubai. <laughs> but wow. it's the only place that everybody could get a visa to, which I found out later. It's a very strange place to be told you had to go to for a meeting. But while I was there, I took advantage of it. I went to the textile market down the old part and I was, you know, I read in the handbook or the guidebook how to buy a pashmina scarf, okay? Ooh. The ins and outs of how to buy it, how to test if it's, you know, not fake or been, if it's synthetic, if they're selling you a fake, that kind of stuff. And things, and they're $200 each. They take 180 hours to make and they are only, they're hand spun and hand woven and they only come from four, four sheep they're sorry, four cashmere goat. <laughs> I'm like, sheep's cashmere? <laughs> four cashmere goat, uh, goat breeds, the only ones that make Pashima. And that's it, that's it, that's all. But you go to Dubai to buy that scarf. I was like, why can't people come to Oregon to buy a linen shirt? Why can't they come you know, here to go and take a tour at the Pendleton Mill, to go down and get some ice cream at Tilmuk Dairy and the coast? and then swoop on through at their blueberry you pick and get a, like, get a, a, a shirt from us. Why can't they do that? Why can't we be that kind of quality? Like there's the Masters of Linen in Belgium, which is a trade organization. Everybody who grows you know, flax and, and produces linen there is part of it. They are a, a very cohesive, tight-knit, tight-knit, nobody, nobody from the outside allowed in kind of group. And they have built a They've built in an integrity and a quality into this product that is known around the world. You go to you go to Belgium, you go get yourself a nice beer, and you head out over to the you know the linen shop next door and you get a little doily or tablecloth or something like that, and it tells a story, and you keep it for the rest of your life, and then you hand it down to your kids, and they keep it for the rest of their life, and it just keeps going, building off from that because it lasts that long. So why can't we be that here? Like why can't we be the Harris Tweed, the Harris Tweed? <laughs> of Oregon. Why can't we do that? Mm -hmm. So we went to Scotland. I love this. I love Tweed so much. <laughs> I love Tweed. <laughs> we went to Scotland in September and it was, I would call it a pilgrimage because that's how I think about Tweed is that it is like you are going, you are going to the center, the heart, where everything is about this product. It's about the sheep, it's about the spinners, it's about the hand weavers, it's about crofting, it's about taking back the highlands after the clearances. It is so historical, it's just dripping with it. And you are in the midst of all of this incredible quality. And everybody around you is wearing tweet. They bought in. <laughs> Every single person you meet in the street has a tweet hat or a scarf or a jacket. And that jacket they have worn since they stopped growing at 22 or whatever and were fitted at the tailor and they wore it to every wedding and they'll probably be buried in it. So it's like, it is so part of their culture that I want flax to be like that. You know, I want wool to be like that here. I want people to like come here, you know, to Oregon to visit and think, oh, I wonder if I'm going to get a flax shirt this year. Like that kind of thing. I want that kind of quality to emanate from this region because like in Italy, they've got a certification that's like the bioregional certification where you know you can only have Chianti and Chianti and you can only have Champagne and Champagne, like that kind of place. Like I want to be like, you can only have linen in Oregon. <laughs> you know? like if you call it Oregon linen and it's not growing in Oregon, then you get in trouble. So that's what I want. <laughs> that's, great. that's great. Well, I have to say just with all of you, I, I feel like anything is possible. <laughs> You know, this, this group, uh, especially just the power, the passion. And Jocelyn, you've been very patient. You're down there on the end. But I'm, I've, yeah, I'm, I'm so curious just, you know, hearing all of this and going back to where you started in your introduction, just um, 
how will mapping help all of this? And what does a natural fibers map look like? And how is it different from the other um, yeah. maps you've made? The, the thing about complex systems, it's really hard to understand a complex system that you can't see. This knowledge that we're talking about up here, it's in Jeannie's head, it's in Jared's head, it's in your heads. These are things that you all have had to piece together and you have this map in your brain and it's hard to share that like just like the you know the prickly boss Carter, right? If the knowledge is in people's brains, those people can get us there, but to spread that knowledge and to help support the system and to get all of you involved to support that system, you need a map. You need something that shows you here's where things are, here's where they're not. Mm -hmm. um, and those maps help start conversations. I love going to a meeting with maps because you put a map down, a paper map down on a on a table and everybody's, there's my house, there's where I work, here's the place that I play, here's the place that I love. And not only that, you start to connect your place with the rest of your place. You understand how it is downstream or upstream or next door. Um, you start to see how it's connected with each other. So uh, with that food work that we did, we sort of uh, had those, they, they opened up conversations where you, it's not just about where things are on the map, but it's why they're there. Um, we, with our food mapping work, we were thinking, okay, maybe we just have to build more slaughterhouses. Maybe we just have to build more warehouses. We start to have conversations with people. Uh, Grass-fed beef, for instance, in Eastern Oregon, we're like, hey, you guys just need another slaughterhouse, that's your problem. And they're like, no, we have grass-fed, we, we, we raise grass-fed fed beef. That's a seasonal product and we grow it on a small scale. So every couple of years somebody comes out here, tries to build another slaughterhouse and it fails because they are built, it's built on the industrial ag system. It requires constant throughput at a huge volume. So the map was really integral in starting that conversation. I think the map here is really integral in laying down this knowledge and letting people share their information. Uh, Shannon and I went to Oregon Flock and Fiber Festival and everybody, if they were a maker, they wanted to know where they could get local fiber. If they were raising sheep, they wanted to know where they could get their fiber processed. Everybody was talking about which mill had just shut down. So it's a constant uh, changeover in information. And the difference between where I usually work in you know, forestry, fisheries, climate, um, salmon, those fields are awash in data. The people who work in those fields just, they are fluent in data. It's already <laughs> processed, it's already prepared, it is already publicly available online, ready to be asked questions, it's ready to tell you its story. But in the fiber world, in the ag world, they've had the same problem with food. That, it's all, still awash in data, but it's in people's brains. It's not in a spreadsheet, it might be in the stories that people tell. It's on people's computers, it's in notebooks. And it's not publicly available. You don't have the information, that clarity, that openness about margins, because you have to survive as a business, and that's the way the system works right now. So the difficulty mapping this system is you have to make the data. You have to prepare all that information and pull it together and get it ready to be asked questions, to get it ready to tell that story. Okay, great. And that is, that's on your list. Is it, we talked about it the is. informal thing for tonight, but where I don't think we're doing it. No, well, if, uh, if I can borrow Jeannie's computer back at her, her uh, desk over there, I forgot to bring my own computer. Um, so I have just a mocked up map uh, uh, that's... Do you want to bring it up here? Oh, no, it's, uh, it weighs like 20 pounds. <laughs> Every, at the end, when we're done, go in the back and we'll take a look at the map. And right now, it's really sparse. I mostly pulled your supply chain, which Jared makes so apparent on the website. It's incredible to see there's a map and you tell the story of your uh, supply chain. Genie's on there. We've got a couple places on there, but if you know of large scale processors or people who are producing, uh, I mean, we haven't really talked about scale tonight, um, which is something that Ecotrust is interested in. The food world, we work in this ag in the middle space. We're right now trying to figure out how to define that ag in the middle for, um, for fiber. How can we be helpful at scale to, to, to be able to, to help this system? Um, so uh, we can pull that up in the back and if you want to add to it, you can. It's a, a, a draft, but gives an idea of what we're trying, trying to do. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, thank you for the reminder. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, I want to make sure there's time for questions because I know that people have them and you guys are amazing resources that um, we should be tapping into beyond the panel. But um, just in, in closing, your elevator pitch, like each one of you, like not the dense introduction, the elevator pitch, but the uh, why should people care? Hmm. When you meet somebody who, who like me, six weeks ago, really didn't know a lot about this world. What, why, why should people care? Because we all wear clothes. 
and we all, I think a lot of times people, it's easy to connect with your food. Like you, people really think about that, what they put in their body. And, but we, we sleep on textiles, they're in our mattresses, they're everywhere. We're sitting on them, we're wearing them. Um, and I don't think people have put as much thought into that. And I think they're starting, more people are wondering, what is this made out of? How does it grow? Where does it grow? And, mm -hmm. But um, our connection to clothing is, you know, it's our human need. Cool. Angela, any thoughts? Um, I, I feel like there are hundreds of people that touch your shirt to make that. Like hundreds of people have touched that shirt to get to your body. And you you could slim that down because you're impacting so many, so many communities across the world by wearing this piece of clothing. You could slim that down to like 10 people <laughs> that touch your shirt, maybe 15. You're shaking your head in the back, 20. Uh, <laughs> dramatically increase your waist. Dramatically increase the waist if we yes. just had 10 people touching yes. your shirt. As somebody working in textile manufacturing today, like there is substantial efficacy and scale. You know, when the DOD stopped buying flax because 9166 became cheap, you know, the DOD's interest in flax and they would like to pilot it. You know. What's the DOD? Department of Defense. It's not all the world in the environment. You know, they are not real. Yeah, exactly. Those are only on only the buyer. Yeah. I feel like it needs to come back home so that we can have more control over the impact on people's lives. Everything that DOD buys is made in America. Oh, no, I'm not saying about the DOD, but just in, yeah, local fiber production in general needs to yeah. come back home. Yeah. But I think that there's a huge difference between the uh, idea of having 10 people work on a shirt and having efficient times. Depends on what shirt. But yeah, depends on what kind of shirt you want. You yeah, have 300 million Americans. Yeah. Well, then we can get to the issue of how much do we all need to consume? I've had tweet suits that have that very highest amount of plastic. I have a lasso. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> 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 so they make those leather patches on them. Uh -huh. <laughs> but. Anyway, I, I feel like it, it needs to come back home so that we have more control over how we impact everybody involved in the supply chain. And the supply chains are giant. I mean, Jeannie said that it is it is so many steps and so many different factors into it that um, by not seeing what's going on, we're, we're contributing to, to degrade, degradation and environmental issues all over the world. And we need to bring it back so we can look and, and be more honest and, and and have more integrity in all supply chain Great. Jared. Yeah, I was going to say we talked mostly tonight about community. Um, I love what Jeannie said about mindset change being the first thing. And this idea of how much is, you know, it's, it's a question of co cost is obviously a huge part of the conversation that we haven't touched on in a, a very troubling part. But... Um, Cost is a different thing when it's how many shirts do I own and, and how, many, how many pairs of clothes do I need and how fast do I wear through them. And you know, this is something that coming from the handmaking community we think about a lot, which is um, how different you think about a shirt or a sweater once you were the one who made it. So I think that that's something that is important for people to think about as well and, and um, you know, something that we're working in a community where that just is part of the, the standard sort of consumer knowledge because they're actually making it. Now, not everyone in the country is going to say, yeah, I want to make a shirt or yeah, I want to make my clothes. Um, but I think everyone can ask a question about how many of those do I need to buy and how often and, and all of these things. So there are a lot of, a lot of barriers. Um, the environment is, is making the issue I think more apparent for people. Hopefully, the faster the better. But um, I think that I—that's my takeaway from the night—is the mindset change. Uh, that's that's where it has to start, and that's when people will start looking for a solution when they are, are not going to accept a mindset that is, in the end, damaging to people in the world. Um, yeah, working closer to home. 
I mean, it improves your own health, the health of your family, supports your local community, the region, the nation, and the planet. We've learned a lot of really powerful lessons. It's been a journey. It's been an evolution. We didn't know these things going in. We didn't even think about it. So the lessons have come from the experiential journey we've had. But I guess I really do believe that um, being involved in the production of your own food, clothing, and shelter, the things that we need to survive as humans on the planet, that that is the strength. What we need on a daily basis to survive, to be retaining that in this country, it's the, very, it's the basis of the strength of every culture and every nation. And that includes America, as well as Peru, or Nepal, or the Philippines. Each culture needs to have some control and involvement in the production of the things we need to survive. And it makes, it makes us stronger. So what has been the total cost of giving all that up and doing it elsewhere. What has been the total cost, the total impact to our personal health, health of our families, communities, this country, our culture, and the planet? So for me, produ producing those things for ourselves is, our, is a part of our core strength, and we need to retain it. Um, I sort of want to touch on something that Jared brought up in terms of cost. At EcoTrust, our food program, the, the core mission there is to feed everybody, to make sure everybody has access to good food. And that um, is not something right now I feel like, selling the fiber work to my coworkers at EcoTrust, there's a hurdle to get over in terms of cost and it feeling like a luxury right now. A luxury to spend the money on, I, I meant to comment earlier, that my dress is uh, from Pendleton's Portland collection and I saved up money to buy this dress and I'm going to own it and hopefully fit into it for the rest of my life. <laughs> this is my Oregon story. This is my Oregon wool story. And it's one that I know Pendleton works super hard and has a really hard time. Um, um, and I don't want to speak for for Pendleton, but um, making happen because of all the things that are happening in our fiber system. That is a luxury and a privilege that I have. I have a luxury and a privilege of spending hours of my time knitting a scarf with wool um, that I pick out and choose um, and, and pay money for. That said, my ability to do that um, supports an economic system. It supports uh, practices that I support. It's a pra uh, not only does it support the people in um, t where I live, but it supports people who are taking care of the salmon in their streams. It is supporting the people who pay the people on their ranch to take care of their animals um, with them. It, there's um, a level of entry here that is uh, sort of can be uncomfortable to talk about. I would love for everybody to be able to wear fiber produced in their region domestically. I think that like organic food, that is down the line. And right now, the reason why right now is so important is because the culture is ready. We understand it with food. And this is sort of a push to make that happen and support the producers, support the processors, and make sure that everybody in the system can thrive. That's terrific. Thank you. Yeah, so I, it's, I mean, I don't know about all of you, but I feel like we've just touched the surface and there's so much more that could be discussed here. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions, and then, but I also want to leave room so that people can, can I, I feel like there's people in the audience, we could have like probably 10 panels. We could just move through these rows, and each one of you, I have a sense, are, you know, our experts or um, specialists in some way. Um, but I want to give you a chance to ask um, these guys' questions, and then afterwards, just a chance to informally um, talk among your, amongst yourselves because you can all be resources to one another. Any questions? Uh, I feel like this group is probably educated enough to already know what the consumers can do is buy a good quality product locally made and know where it's from. So I'm wondering if there are any other um, sort of grassroots or consumer 
steps or initiatives that people like in this room and that we talk to can take to help support, like, is there a Kickstarter for that fax machine in Belgium or like to pay the middleman's salary to educate my people? And it's a twofold question, because Jocelyn, I'm also curious, once the fire map is made, can people in this room access that and find out where the gaps are? So how can we get involved in these initiatives? Yes, yeah, so through Fiber Shed, um, we are, I've been working under um, affiliate sponsorship from Fiber Shed, and we are now working to have Pacific Northwest Fiber Shed have their own 501c3, which will open doors to a lot more opportunities. Um, we've been writing grants, <laughs> we write lots of grants, um, but we are part of that organizing ourselves and kind of building our team in a real way like I have a team but I need this um, we will be able to put things like that up like okay we're going to Europe in June to really get numbers and what do we need and what's this going to look like and then our hope is to get that open you know through fiber shed we will start getting that info out to people the map we envision would be open source. It would be available to everyone. Um, so it's taken a lot of legwork to get it kind of organized in a way where we could accept funds and accept, you know, um, yeah. Yep. That answers it. Yep. Good. I have a question. Having developed acrylic fibers that are in the market and knowing exactly how hard that is, I cannot imagine trying what you guys are trying to do, bringing back flaps. How much have you actually managed to make, is question one. Like, so, I'm sorry. how much yarn have you managed to make, is question one. No, question two is, yarn. wow, what happens if somebody wants to buy all of it? I don't think we would sell it to them, but yes. <laughs> um, we're not at yarn stage because we just started last year, so yeah. we're, there isn't enough seed available in the country to be able to grow enough flax to to have enough raw material to then do it in processing. So it's at the beginning stages. So and we, I mean, I've been an organic farmer for 13 years. Uh, Ralph has been farming for 150 years in the same spot. So, not, not, not Ralph. Not, 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 not Ralph personally. His family. <laughs> So there, and he comes from a long, long line of grassy farmers, and and big ag farmers in Oregon. So we're partnering with them and learning from the failed attempts to grow flax in Oregon with Krylar and, and all the other uh, pilot projects that happened through the USDA SARE grants and stuff. We've done our research and we have like figured out how is it possible that we could revive this, and it's going to be a very strong farmer base. And it's and just like Jeannie said, it's a link through the entire supply chain. And because most of it was going to be certified, everybody has to give up those kind of numbers. Everybody has to talk to everybody else. And so that's what we want to instill in the entire program from the very beginning so that it doesn't become a trying to talk people into this kind of thing when they're already doing growing linen or growing flax already and we're trying to pull them to our side. We're basically starting at ground zero. So. Good luck. That's That's Seed growers, yep. and you know they have harvesting equipment, but I'm pretty sure I tell my friend that one of the things that we can grow are machinists. <laughs> you know, some of those babies can turn into machinists. They can. So you know, there's machinery that can be a tool. So I'm very curious to know back to that where you're going to be reporting from your results. Oh, it's here. Oh, so it's we're approaching sure with OSU and it's growing at the yeah, and then we also. Um, because there's um, the agronomy department there is just so extensive. There's so many different aspects of it we can pull from. So there's the barley project that's happening at Hislop. 
farm and they have a bunch of dry land uh, issues going on they're they're always trying to work through and they there's a lot of crossover let's just so say that. Oregon hosts that rains conference every year Portland hosts the rains conference every mm -hmm. year and did you present because that's where the big seed growers yeah that's where all those tests those folks did you present for those folks we haven't gone to it yet because we started last year. So <laughs> we're not there yet. But we went to we went to the small farms conference at OSU. The small farms conference at OSU is hugely popular. Nine hundred people were there, and that was a great opening to like. We sold seed. We have seed for sale outside, and such. And we're taking that crop from last year that we harvested at OSU, and then turning it around to use it as an educational tool for getting more people involved in growing. So we have a small list of farmers that are already interested in doing the seed side, and then a small group that's already interested in the fiber side. And where it's going to where it's going to break is that we need to have a good, reliable harvester that we can shuttle around to everybody's plots. And so we're probably going to buy a rice reaper, would be the, the thing that we're going to get this year, which is hand-driven, pretty large, it can do barley, rice, all cereal crops, and flats. And it'll lay it down in the right way that we want for dew redding, and then we'll bale it with a regular baler that we would have from New Holland, retooled so that it send the line through the entire cinnamon roll of flax. And then store that, and then move on to when we actually go to Belgium and start talking to processors about equipment, how we can get it over here, when we can set it up, that kind of thing. It'll be stored so we'll have like a mass of raw material to work with, and then then we'll start doing the pilot for processing it. Yeah. And one thing that's helping you is wheat prices are really bad. <laughs> they need some rotation. So <laughs> hopefully they'll rotate crop into flax. So that's what we're hoping. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, um, all, the, all the places that you guys uh, have your practice and your businesses in is, you know, the, the ground floor, you know, in the ground literally. And it's many steps between there and what we're all wearing. Mm -hmm. Everyone's wearing the building. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we're in a city with a $25 billion company, apparel company, footwear, but you know, apparel, you know, between Nike, Columbia, Adidas, that's that's fifty billion dollars mm -hmm. in, in top line revenue. It's all largely five days, so it's a lot. So, could you guys address, or do you have any points of view? I mean, I'm, look, I'm, really, I'm trying to figure out the disconnect between the the acre of flax, which is you know a pretty left of mainstream fiber these days. It's a fabulous fiber, but it's not. Um, and I say that owning a, a an apparel company, so I know a little bit about this, but. Could you comment on the, you know, that gap in the distance from the, um, the very artisanal place you are and to speak to the, what are we, rebuilding our domestic apparel system? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want me to start? <laughs> so I started artisanal. <laughs> I tried, started artisanal and then went up. So, yes, I have been a partner with Ralph Lauren, J. Crew, Ethan Allen, and so on. Home, fashion, apparel, accessory. So why is it so darn hard? We know that Nike committed $10, $10 million to make Portland Bike Town USA. Great, great thing they did. Not knocking that at all. But what if Nike just committed $1 million to buy American yarn for a product? Make it a sock. I don't care. Make it a scarf. Make it a whatever. They would not, it wouldn't be a donation. It would be the buying of a product that would help the American textile system source American fibers and put it into a project. Why not? Why is it so hard for the corporate mindsets to shift the corporate inertia to change from the existing way business is done. I mean, I'm just a rancher, ranch wife. I'm just a nobody, <laughs> right? Uh, really. But it is really hard. So what you have is you have visionaries inside every company. You have people that love this idea. And they try to float that support up the corporate chain of command. But it's, I mean, some of you in here probably work for those for big companies. How long does it take to make a change 
from an existing supply chain they've already put in place, they've got people everywhere, they've got agents. I don't know the answer, but it's really hard. And somewhere, somehow, we have to find some people who are willing to convince somebody inside those companies because it's really hard to get it off the ground with just startups. People who are going to have, my production order is going to be 250 pounds. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. You know, we need some scale. Mm -hmm. And we need people inside brands who are influential to make those first commitments. I don't know how you get there, but it's the corporate inertia. And what business as usual, people usually don't make changes unless they're forced into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's human nature, right? We're kind of drugged there kicking and screaming, aren't we? Mm -hmm. uh, my experience is it's very, you get a visionary inside J. Crew. The guy that first called me from J. Crew is now gone. Is it Frank? No, it wasn't Frank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you find that, and I mean, I can name 12 people at Ralph Lauren who got fired, laid off in this terrible retail change we're in. We're in this changing retail climate, and it's affecting brands Everybody, it's affecting everybody. Brick and mortars are closing. The needle arts industry is struggling really hard. Um, people are closing stores. You know, they're trying to figure out how to compete with Amazon. <laughs> I don't have a... The icebergs are melting. <laughs> <laughs> but human, human mindset and the resistance to change the, the challenge for creative people inside corporate structures to float new ideas mm -hmm. up and how to change the corporate inertia mm -hmm. is really challenging. It's, I, I will comment on that. I think it's, it's interesting to just, um, you know, it, it's one crop at a time. I mean, I happen to know that Nike, there isn't enough organic cotton in the world to meet Nike's demand. They buy all that they can to their credit. Yeah. And do they do a lot of other good things um, that's spoken as an alum. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, you know, so that, so that is fair. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's, it's like, so how do you make flax mm -hmm. relevant to those companies? How do you make wool relevant to those companies so that they are, it does pencil out for them to invest at well, scale? Well, wool, wool is making such a huge comeback worldwide yeah. across every sector, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. every sector in apparel, accessory, fashion, recreation, sports, that you would think, why don't they look to America? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's hard to get into those bigger companies because it's hard to convince people that there's less is more. Mm -hmm. We're all taught by the capitalism that we're supposed to consume more. Mm -hmm. It's more expensive to use, produce locally, and we're like very few of us are actually willing to produce less and pay more for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I work for a small company, so we produce locally, and it's, even though people who come to us care about buying locally and buying from local artists, even them, they, it's still hard to convince them that they really should buy like the real thing, that is 100% made here. Mm -hmm. yeah. They will still opt and opt for the slightly cheaper option. Mm -hmm. One more? Have you guys noticed any efforts in the community at your level, or actually I guess maybe one step above you guys too, where if um, you know if the scale is an issue and someone only needs 250, mm -hmm. not know the terminology of not in this industry, but I know there's there's someone over here who needs that 250, and there's someone over here who needs that 150, and there's someone here that just needs 50, and there's someone who needs five. Is like we're talking about asking the next level up or the people at the tip top to be visionaries and want more. Are people at your level and the ones in the production chain looking down and saying, hey, what if I got you five together and put you on the same dye lot? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can make this work. Or the washing. Well, the, fir the first problem that happens with that, and that's a really good thing, that's part of what the Let's Talk Coffee thing does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and there are companies doing that. There are companies trying to piggyback to make things work but really in specific niches, like particularly in the RWS certified responsible wool. But the problem you have with that is designers are, <laughs> how many of you in this room are designers? <laughs> Some. <laughs> um, but people uh, want something unique, right? So they want their own gauge and their own ply and their own color, right? 
So it's really tough to piggyback that together mm -hmm. because everybody wants something really special and unique. So mm -hmm. you need to do 100 special runs instead of <laughs> putting them all together. But there might be some people in this room that have an answer to your question. That might have experience with that. Yeah. Too. And I, that's, that's actually a great place to end because I want to encourage people to, before you get up and go get a glass of wine or start chatting, just maybe turn to a neighbor that you don't know <laughs> and introduce yourself and, and say why you're here. Because the person that's, that might be the one to help you solve your problem might be right next to you or sitting behind you and it would be a shame to leave without knowing them. So maybe do that. And um, thank you. I mean, you, we have such experts here and with such passion. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.